Eleanor, if I want to really believe in God, I have to confront the problem of evil. Why is there evil in the world? But there's a bigger question. And that is that if there's a God, how can there possibly be a hell where for temporal sin I would be given eternal punishment? Well, I think that's a good question. But I think it's conceived in the wrong sorts of terms, see? So you're thinking of hell like this. You're thinking God is an accountant and he measures how much evil you've done in your life gets his calculator out and figures how much punishment that's worth, and then makes a mistake and gives infinite punishment for a short-term sin. That's the wrong way to think about it entirely. Totally wrong way to think about it. Here's the right way to think about it. How do you love somebody? How do you love somebody? And what do you want if you love them? What you want is to be united with them. My heart and your heart. My mind and your mind. Coming together into one. So we can together be bonded in a kind of harmony that produces both joy and peace. Okay, if that's what I want, then guess what? There got to be two wills operative here, one in me and one in you. Because unless there's a will in you as well as a will in me, we're not going to get any bondedness, no union, no harmony. If my will is in me and my will is in you, there's just me, there's no, no union. So as long as what I want is union and love, i got to let you have a will too, see? And if you have a will too, here's, here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom bad news. You can use it to unite with me in love, or you can use it to reject me. And that's what i got to accept as a possibility if I allow you to have a will as well as me. Okay, I, I, I can follow that logic, but I have a couple problems with it. Well, you didn't actually get to finish. Okay. You can, re you, can, you, can, you can reject me forever. If you go on forever, you can reject me forever. Now, you might think to yourself, this is ridiculous. The guy sees hell. The first minute he's in hell, he's going to think, oh, wow, what was I thinking? I'm out of here. Let's do it over again. I really want what you want, okay? But notice that in a case like that, the guy doesn't really want union and love. He just wants what he wants for himself. He doesn't like what he didn't like before. He doesn't like, he doesn't like God any more than he did like. He just wants to get out of where he is. You can take him out of where he is and put him anywhere at all, and he still won't like God. He still won't like the good stuff. In other words, he is a hell producer in himself. He's a hell. Milton, Milton Satan says, I'm hell. And wherever I am, that's where hell is. That's the whole point. So, so hell in the old tradition isn't God's torture chamber. It's where God does what he can to produce as much connection to goodness as he can for people fundamentally committed, intransigently committed to hating the good. That's the idea. Okay. Let's, let's kind of look at some of the parts of it. First of all, if my will and your will are two people that are, that are pretty equal, I think I'm a little older than you, but we're about tons, the same age. Tons, older than about you. About the Just same tons. age. Uh, maybe we have a, a, a grandparent in common, uh, lived in the same country. Yeah. We, we have similarities, so we're common. Yeah. So, so yeah. for your will and my will to have a friendship, I understand that. Yeah. But how can you equate... God, if there is a God, with any individual. It's such an imbalance of power. It is such, absolutely. So asymmetrical. It is it's absolutely. very unfair what you've just it said. It is absolutely an imbalance of power. Mm. Absolutely. And so God has got to proceed very carefully. So one thing you can say is, um, look, maybe, maybe what God should have done, empty hell, is right in the starry skies of heaven. Hey, I'm God. I'm mm. here. Think about it. But then we'd have exactly what you're worried about. So what God has to do in order to avoid exactly this abuse of power that you're talking about is, he has to present himself to us not by means that bring home to us his power, but by means that bring home to us his love and his goodness. And that is what we have in the major monotheisms, where God presents himself to us through stories and stories of personal interaction to help us see what he's like as a person and what there is to love about him, like that. For any of the individuals who wind up in hell in whatever period of time, is there ever any chance that any of them will legitimately 
uh, come out of that? Well, it turns out that's a more complicated question than you'd think. So C.S. Lewis has it. C.S. Lewis has an idea which is a really interesting idea, but it shows you the complexity of the question. So here's his idea. He has this funny idea, he, which he presents in a kind of a story. His idea is: Look, there's a a regular bus line from heaven, from hell to heaven, and anybody in hell who wants to can get on the bus, head for heaven. You like it there? You can stay there, no problem. But this is what he says: For those people who get on the bus and get off in heaven and stay there. They were never really in hell in the first place. It was that what they were in, in that seemed to be hell was for them actually something like a purgative antechamber to heaven. Well, so you're, you're cheating. So, you're defining hell retrospectively. Right, right. That's why I'm saying the question is complicated, because as long as that kind of C.S. Lewis move is, is available, the, que the question, does anybody ever get out of hell, is a more complicated question than you think. So, so, so but suppose you're then, we... You're, you're then defining anybody in hell who will be there f forever uh, in kind of a, in a post facto way, right? I mean, so... Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, that's right. But it's just, that's just, because so that logical that, move is there, it so, complicates the question. So I think your answer question. is yes, but I think your answer then would be yes. People who are in hell, some can come out of it, but then you would say retrospectively that those people were not of the same character of the, of, of, of the people who were there. Right. I wanted just to mention the complication so we can put it to one side and look at the question without the complication. Okay. For what really, really counts as hell, does anybody ever get out? Now, um, the, the tradition, the monotheistic tradition I know, unanimously answers no to that question. That is the old monotheistic tradition, represented by Sadia Gaon on the Jewish side, Thomas Aquinas on the Christian side. I don't have enough competence in Islam to be sure of myself on that side. But uh, they unanimously say no. Nobody who's ever really in hell ever gets out. Now, if you go to look at a very sophisticated philosophical theologian like Aquinas and ask why, the answer has to do not with theology. It has to do with psychology. I've been over and over that answer. And the bottom line is, I don't really understand it. So I can say it to you. I can say it to you, but I can't really explain it to you. So it goes something like this. What, what does it take to change your mind? takes new information or a new way of looking at old information. The idea is, in the instant of death, you acquire all information pertinent to the decision. Do you love the good or don't you? And in that moment of dying, in that last process, where all this information is somehow available to you, you make your decision. C.S. Lewis gives us a picture that's helpful here. Do you like he, that kind of God who would just make that instant decision for all eternity? I mean, well, no, I, I make so no, many mistakes no, in no, my life. No, no, at see, the end of my life, I'm going to make a mistake like that, and you're going to put me there. <laughs> no, you look like a, such a nice person. You no, know, no, no. You see, it's not that. It's not that. It, that's why I told you in the beginning. I can't. I can't defend this answer because I don't entirely uh, understand it. But I can show you how it works. It's not that you make one mistake and then later you see your mistake and now you can't get over it. No. It's that in order to change your mind, you have to have information relevant to the decision, or you have to look at old information in a new way. If you are in an epistemic position like this, everything is already available to you, pertinent to the decision, and you decide this way, after that there's no way to change your mind. Everything's already been given to you. There's nothing to add anymore. That's the problem, is that your decision, your psychology is set. But I don't actually understand it. And if, in fact, it turns out that there really is a bus line from heaven to hell, that the old traditions were wrong, I don't think it would make any difference to anything we really care about. But if there were a bus line from hell to heaven, you'd be happier, right? No, because then maybe there'd be a bus line from heaven to hell. And then what happens to your heaven? What do you know about yourself? On any given day, you can do those things which you yourself would hate to do. Could you really guarantee that if there were a bus line from heaven to hell, you wouldn't get on it? 
That's the kind of thing we do. We do self-destructive things. So if there were a bus line between the two, that would do go a long way toward making heaven a whole lot more like life on earth. And who needs that? You know? but, but, but here's the other thing to notice, see? Community and expertise go together. Expertise in anything, medicine, anything, is vested in the community. So who wants a doctor who's a marginalized outsider from the medical community? Nobody. And the religious tradition, the old religious tradition, common to Judaism and Christianity, I can't speak for Islam, I don't have a credential to talk about Islam, but, but that old religious tradition says people in hell stay there. My own thought is, my own thought is, I don't have this kind of boyish arrogance that I would think, I got it wrong. All oh, smart people got it wrong. And I got it right and they got it wrong. I don't feel that, I don't feel that's a wise way to go unless you absolutely have to. Unless you absolutely have to. It's possible a community could get it wrong, but it's unlikely. So since that's a communal view, I want to tread carefully. If the community turned out to be wrong on that score and there was a bus line from hell to heaven, <laughs> One way. One way, yeah, <laughs> just one way. Who cares? What would that really change? Oh, I'd li yeah. like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh.